Ever since the collapse of the cryptocurrency trading platform FTX in November 2022, legal drama upon legal drama has ensued. From the arrests and prosecution of members of the corporate leadership of FTX and its sister company Alameda Research to class action lawsuits filed by some of the fraud victims of FTX against celebrities and influencers alike, there has been plenty of litigation to go around. In this video, we're focusing on one lawsuit in particular, a class action filed by a group of plaintiffs who lost money in FTX filed against a group of quote unquote finfluencers, influencers on social media in the financial niche. And more specifically, we're talking about the most recent court drama brought on by one of the defendants, Ben Armstrong, better known on the internet as BitBoy Crypto. Get ready for a lot of unnecessary stupid. So in order to really tell the story adequately, we kind of have to go back to the beginning to the source of all of these lawsuits. The story basically begins in November 2022 with the collapse of FTX, a cryptocurrency trading platform that was previously considered to be worth billions of dollars. What quickly emerged was that there was, let's say, an improper relationship between FTX and its sister company, a quantitative trading firm called Alameda Research. Both of these companies were run by Sam Bankman-Fried, commonly known as SBF. FTX claimed that they were hacked and that the hackers stole up to $477 million at one point, but as investigation into the company deepened, this was looking less and less like a hack and more and more like fraud. On December 12, 2022, SPF was arrested by Bahamian authorities and was later extradited to the U.S. for one of many lawsuits that blossomed out of FTX's collapse. Now, aside from the lawsuits that were filed against SBF and the people who ran FTX and Alameda Research, there were multiple lawsuits that were also filed against people who had promoted the FTX platform. One was against a bunch of celebrities like Tom Brady, Larry David, Shaquille O'Neal, and more. Not Taylor Swift, though, because she apparently does some fantastic due diligence when it comes to her brand deals. Anyway, then there are the lawsuits against the social media influencers. So on March 15th, 2023, plaintiffs in this case filed a class action lawsuit against 10 defendants, nine influencers and one LLC suing for $1 billion. The core allegation of this lawsuit is that the defendants were allegedly all paid money by FTX to promote the FTX platform to consumers and that as a result, they can be held liable for selling unregistered securities. I'm not going to go into a deep analysis of the underlying lawsuit here and the claims in the underlying lawsuit here, because that's not really the focus of this video. But basically, I can tell you that I think that the plaintiffs are likely to have a bit of an uphill challenge on a number of aspects of this lawsuit. One of those battles is going to be proving that the defendants somehow became agents of FTX when they decided to accept a sponsorship contract from them. And another big battle here is likely to be whether or not the thing that the consumers here were purchasing was in fact unregistered securities. There's a lot more that can be said about all of that, but basically I personally don't think that these are particularly strong claims. And that's one of the kickers for this story, by the way, because the defendants here arguably have the upper hand in this case, at the very least at the outset, so long as they don't do something stupid to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Anyway, one of the defendants named was Ben Armstrong, more widely known as BitBoy Crypto. This is a cryptocurrency influencer who has around a million followers on Twitter and around a million and a half subscribers on YouTube. And despite the fact that he apparently technically hadn't been served yet, two days after the complaint was filed on March 17th, he posted a video to his YouTube channel talking about the substance of the lawsuit. And in this video, he lays a number of threats against the named plaintiff and his lawyers. The judge would throw, probably throw it out because it's frivolous. Um, but here's the thing about a frivolous lawsuit. Now that it has been put out there, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Law Firms behind all this, now it's been put out there. Now you can't take it back. Now you have, in fact, defamed my name with 100% provably false allegations. Oh, and Edwin Garrison. Oh, Edwin Garrison. I know you went, I know you sued everybody. I know you sued FTX. I know you sued Sam. I know you're, you're suing a uh, Shaq. You're suing Kevin O'Leary. He probably deserves it. You're suing Steph Curry. Splash. 
Oh, but you haven't tried to sue old Pit Boy. A lot of these people, they back down and they're scared. They're scared. Well, I've literally done nothing wrong and I'm going to come at you full force. I hope you're ready. I hope you and your army of incompetent ambulance chasing lawyers are ready because you have picked up the fight of your life. These other people, they'll shut their mouth. They'll, they'll shut their mouth because they're scared you're going to take everything from them. Well, guess what, Edwin? I'm going to take everything from you. I hope you're ready. Be blessed, Pit Boy Allen. I am so tempted to talk about his claim that he is going to be able to sue all of them in response to this, but I really can't in this video because there's already so much to talk about here, and I really want to try to keep things focused. If you do want to see a video on that, though, let me know in the comments down below. If there is enough interest in that, I will be happy to do a follow-up. Anyway, the point I'm making with this is that basically immediately following the news of the lawsuit, BitBoy started a harassment campaign against the named plaintiff and the plaintiff's counsel. A lot of it, in my opinion, is pretty petty and gross with personal attacks on people who are just working at the firm and arguably just doing their jobs. But it apparently got bad enough really quickly because just five days after the complaint was filed, plaintiff's counsel filed a request for a status conference to address the harassment. And a couple weeks later, they elaborated on their claims by filing a notice of proof of materials for the show cause hearing. There are all kinds of receipts in this filing. Similar to BitBoy's initial video, it's also undisputed that he posted a ton of tweets harassing the plaintiff's side, particularly the lawyers representing the plaintiffs, and sent a number of emails that included profanities and threats of different kinds. For example, here's an email he apparently sent on March 20th, 2023 to plaintiff's counsel. As you can see here, it says, hey all, just wanted to let you all know that I received this notice and I couldn't be happier. You are all so kind to let me know that you are all dumb mother effing See you next Tuesdays. I've been waiting on this so I can file my countersuit. You are all effed. I'm going to not only sue you and win easily, but I'm coming for all your effing licenses. You don't understand who you have effed with, but you will. Thank you, Ben Armstrong. And it should be noted that BitBoy has admitted and one would even say gloated about sending harassing emails to plaintiff's counsel. But plaintiff's counsel also claims that BitBoy left threatening and otherwise harassing phone calls and voicemails for the firm, which is a point that BitBoy actually disputes. But even if he's telling the truth about that, Arguably, anyone can be excused for still thinking that the totality of the circumstances here point towards the conclusion that BitBoy has been harassing and threatening plaintiff's counsel. But even still, to those who are familiar with BitBoy Crypto's style and his history, this doesn't exactly sound like it's outside the realm of possibilities. He's been accused a number of times by a number of people of defrauding or otherwise taking advantage of his own viewers and followers, for example. Oh man, we're really in for a treat today. So the man you just saw having a mental breakdown is BitBoy Crypto. This guy is basically one of the largest crypto channels, but has also been known for being a shady dirtbag who milks his audience for a quick buck rather than giving them genuine advice. I've been compiling this video for a while, but I've been waiting for a good reason to drop it. And I might have been given that reason and served on a silver platter. That last video, by the way, was by the YouTuber that goes by the name Atozi. When he came out with that video, BitBoy Crypto responded that he was suing him for defamation. And then he did sue him for defamation. Tonight, I had this visitor at my door. How you doing today? Good. Are you early? Full name? Big, Big Shul? Yeah. Who are you delivering for? Just like I just got some stuff for you. Oh, what is it? I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a box. I don't need it. Well, you've been served early. What are you doing? So yeah, I have officially been sued. I used the term scam in my title because it was my honest opinion based on public information that it seemed dishonest for this guy who's a self-proclaimed cryptocurrency expert to promote something like he did this PAMP token. I also covered how he plagiarized another crypto journalist by the name of Vince. I think it's insane that I'm being sued for expressing my own opinions. I thought I lived in America. Imagine how thin skin you have to be to do this. And from what I've heard, this isn't the first time he's filed a lawsuit like this. I'm going to be standing up for myself because I don't believe people 
should just be able to throw money at lawyers to make their shady actions go away. And I also don't think that people should be rewarded by filing outrageous lawsuits. Clearly, I don't have all the money to fight this lawsuit because I've been quoted from various lawyers that this could cost $50,000 to $500,000 just to defend myself. Clearly, this is a massive inconvenience. So if you guys do want to support me here, I will be linking a GoFundMe down below, a Bitcoin address, an Ethereum address in the description down below. If there's any leftover funds from this, I will be donating this to various charities because I have no intentions of profiting from raising money from you guys. This turned out to be a huge mistake because BitBoy Crypto seemed to come to the embarrassing realization, seemingly at about the exact same time that the rest of the world did, that he did not have a colorable defamation claim. 100% provably false allegations. Essentially, there was massive backlash all over social media, and once Otozi published a video to YouTube telling his viewers that he was being sued, a litigation fund was created on GoFundMe. Within 24 hours, the fund received over $20,000, and he received crypto donations amounting to at least $100,000. So BitBoy Crypto put lipstick on a pig and put on the presentation that he had independently decided not to proceed with the litigation. This wasn't supposed to get this far. Um, so at this point, like I said, there, there is nothing really we can do. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, the money has came in on his side. Uh, the lawsuit was never about money. Um, so hopefully, you know, it tells you now that we're going to be officially dropping this. I don't, I emailed my lawyer uh, about 15 minutes where we went on air here. So that is going to be happening. Rewind that clip for a second and l really listen to what BitBoy is saying. So at this point, like I said, there, there is nothing really we can do. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, the money has came in on his side. Uh, the lawsuit was never about money. There's nothing you can do because the money came in on his side? What, what is that about? Suddenly the guy you're in a legal battle with has the funds to fight his case and that makes your lawsuit worthless? And it wasn't just this statement that BitBoy said when he was basically dropping the lawsuit that was questionable. He also said this. We did not want this to become public. Uh, I guess when I decided to do this back in November, I want to keep this behind closed doors. I've had another lawsuit. It was behind closed doors and it worked out great. Yeah, he wanted to keep it behind closed doors. He's sorry it got out. It's already suspicious when you start to talk like that. But I also don't know if this is really true because BitBoy knew this thing would become public, which is like what confused me about this whole thing. So it's just funny that he's like, oh, I thought this would be behind closed doors. No, no, no. You thought you could get away with it and you couldn't. He thought nobody was going to come to a Tozi's aid. He thought that the only people who would support a Tozi are kids borrowing from their mom's purse. So BitBoy voluntarily withdrew the lawsuit less than a week later. To some, this confirmed a sense of guilt in the face of Atozi's initial scam claims. But not only that, when FTX collapsed and the world seemed to want Sam Bankman-Fried's head on a platter, BitBoy Crypto apparently flew to the Bahamas where SBF was living at the time to harass SBF about FTX. Just tell us a little bit about why you're here today. Yeah, so uh, basically we had planned to come down here and do a protest to get Sam arrested. Uh, we were told if we brought down investors, we brought down a lot of people from the United States, put a lot of pressure on the Bahamian government, that they would be forced to arrest him. Whether SBF deserved that harassment is entirely a matter of opinion, and it should be remembered, a lot of people lost a lot of their hard-earned money when FTX collapsed. So emotions were understandably running high. But aside from that, there were those who were starting to question BitBoy Crypto's motives in coming out so hard against FTX and SBF in an almost obsessive fashion. He was fashioning himself as the people's champion, but why? Was it because he genuinely cared about all of the people who had lost their hard-earned money? Or was it maybe because he wanted to rebrand his image in the community from having the reputation of a crypto scammer who profited off of his followers? Or perhaps was it a darker reason, like trying to distract from some sense of guilt over some kind of a role he may have played in the entire dumpster fire of a situation that was FTX. Now, in all fairness to BitBoy Crypto, it should be noted that he apparently did give warnings to his followers in the months leading up to FTX's collapse. But there's more. FTX is ruining the chance for the average person to make money in crypto. They're playing games with people's lives, and that's not right. It's time to expose FTX and SBF 
what they really are. Let's get it. And I will say that at this point, I personally have not been able to find any kind of evidence of him pushing the FTX platform. There are videos of him promoting FTT, which is the native token for the FTX platform. Okay, so here are the two coins. Number one, FTT. Number two, Thor chain. Okay. Now FTT. <laughs> Why? Yeah, I've said before, this is going to be one of the number one coins we were going to accumulate in the bear market, but I've got some inside info that this thing is about to explode in the next few weeks. But anyway, my point here is to highlight that Bitcoin crypto does have a capability and some might even say a tendency to resort to extreme tactics when he is going up against a perceived enemy. And it's pretty clear here that he sees the plaintiff and probably more particularly his counsel as an enemy. So anyway, after being sufficiently convinced that BitBoy Crypto had been effectively served with the complaint and all of the other relevant filings, the proof of which was a fun video that BitBoy Crypto apparently asked the process server to take of him to give to Adam Moskowitz, the plaintiff's counsel, uh, in response. you. I received this paperwork. I love it. I'm going to bury you. I, I don't think you understand how misled on the situation you are and how wrong. You're going to find out and you're going to pay, bud. And after being convinced that BitBoy Crypto had done enough here to warrant needing to come in and answer for his actions, on April 12th, 2023, the judge ordered him to personally appear on April 20th to talk about what the hell was going on here. Let's pause for a second here because this is important. The judge wasn't saying here that she wanted BitBoy Crypto to just appear at the hearing. That would mean that BitBoy Crypto could appear by having his lawyer represent him and that he didn't actually have to be there physically himself. Rather, the judge says that she wanted BitBoy Crypto, Ben Armstrong, but you know what I mean, to personally appear, meaning regardless of whether his lawyer showed up to the hearing, BitBoy Crypto had to be someone who was actually physically there at the hearing face to face. I want to make that clear because it's really important to highlight exactly what the judge was ordering, especially considering the fact that BitBoy Crypto does not show up to this hearing. And instead, he sends a lawyer to represent him at the hearing and then puts up social media posts taunting the judge. He was apparently going on a cruise in the Caribbean and he said he didn't give, quote, AF. You can't make this up. When I saw all of this playing out in real time, I thought I was going to lose my mind because even though it's clear that BitBoy Crypto clearly doesn't respect respect opposing counsel, he kind of needs to respect the federal judge that is overseeing this case. If he doesn't, he can face some pretty harsh repercussions. And communicating to the judge that you don't respect their orders for like 99% of people is a very fast way to be held in contempt of court and to be sanctioned. And sanctions can come in a lot of different forms, but very often those are monetary sanctions. And remember, this is a case where the defendants arguably have the upper hand with respect to the underlying claims, which just punctuates just how stupid and unnecessary this all is. I mean, this is a situation that has been entirely created out of nothing by BitBoy Crypto. It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. So anyway, once it becomes clear that BitBoy Crypto is not showing up at the April 20th hearing. So bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. The judge asked the attorney representing him, Mr. Rindenau, about BitBoy Crypto's absence. According to the judge's April 20th order, here's how things went down at the hearing. Quote, although expressly ordered to appear, defendant Armstrong failed to appear at the status conference held on April 20th, 2023. Mr. Rindenau indicated that he was retained by defendant Armstrong to appear on his behalf. Mr. Rindenau stated that defendant Armstrong was aware that he had been ordered to appear at the status conference pursuant to this court's April 12th, 2023 
Street order, but Mr. Rindenau was unable to explain why his client had not appeared as directed. Defendant Armstrong did not submit written response to plaintiff's request or notice, despite being given the opportunity to do so by this court. Plaintiffs presented evidence at the hearing that Defendant Armstrong was not only aware of the hearing, but that he willfully and intentionally chose not to appear and publicly disclose his intention to contravene this court's order requiring his appearance. As explained on the record at the status conference, the court finds that the defendant Armstrong failed to comply with this court's order by failing to appear. So considering all of the facts that are in front of her, here's what the judge concludes. The court finds that plaintiff's counsel has presented sufficient evidence to demonstrate that defendant Armstrong has crossed the line from civil communications with plaintiff's counsel to harassment in connection with this matter. This harassment has occurred in the form of repetitive telephone calls to plaintiff's counsel's law firm and threats, direct or indirect, real or perceived, to plaintiff's and plaintiff's counsel's safety. First Amendment rights, and in particular the right to free speech, are vital and warrant the strongest protections, but they cannot be used as a shield to defend harassing, threatening, and dangerous conduct like that engaged in here. Defendant Armstrong's conduct at issue is not only dangerous, but is precisely the conduct courts have prescribed rather than protected. By failing to respond to plaintiff's filings and failing to appear before the court, defendant Armstrong has given the court no basis to find otherwise. She's absolutely correct about the application of the First Amendment here and the fact that if he's not there to give his side of the story and his attorney can't really give a good answer as to why he's not there, the judge has every reason to make this kind of a conclusion against him. So the judge then sets a hearing for the following Monday, April 24th. And I will say that not every judge is going to give a second try like that. Many would give harsher and swifter punishments to a party who now is acting poorly in the face of not just opposing counsel, but also the court itself. So as April 24th rolled up, those of us watching in real time were wondering if he was going to show up to this one and what the judge was going to say. And what do you know? He shows up this time and in a fashion that just about encapsulates the stereotypical crypto bro. And he apparently prepared a statement for this hearing. He's since released that statement on Twitter, so I've had an opportunity to look at it. In it, he says he couldn't be at the April 20th hearing because he already committed to going on a cruise with his fans to the Bahamas, a trip he says they paid a lot of money for. Okay, that's fair. Scheduling conflicts with regard to hearings happen all the time. And when it comes to hearings that have been put on a calendar without the input of one of the parties, they very often can be rearranged. But the mistake here is in just throwing a giant middle finger to the judge and to the court on social media. Metaphor. What he should have done is provided some kind of correspondence to the court ahead of the April 20th hearing and that is explaining the fact that he has a conflict on that particular date that he is supposed to appear and that he needs a continuance so that he can actually be there in person. This at least shows an effort to comply with the court's order. And given the fact that he was given notice of the April 20th hearing by April 5th, he arguably had plenty of time to figure out how to make that happen. He says in his statement that he has a general counsel who is quote unquote international. I'm not sure what he means by that, but regardless, he has an attorney who can advise him that he can't just ignore a court order. So in my opinion, really, he doesn't have any excuse for not taking care of that ahead of time. But the court may have been softened by BitBoy apologizing for not appearing at the last hearing and saying that, quote, we won't have any issues as I now have representation to help me know what I need to appear at and what I don't, unquote. He also brings up an interesting argument about the allegation regarding the harassing phone calls and voicemails. He says, quote, I have never once picked up a phone call to call plaintiff's counsel or this law firm. In fact, not only did I not do it, I couldn't have. My show was still live at 1.07 p.m. on March 17th. I then recorded videos until 1.49 p.m. EST that we have proof of, and I brought signed statements from multiple people on my team that they were with me during this time. In fact, for the last call during the five o'clock hour, I was live streaming on my son's YouTube channel. If those timestamps do in fact line up, that is a pretty good argument. However, it's still not fully ironclad. Playing devil's advocate here, it is still possible that he could have had 
someone else do it on his behalf, knowing that he had plausible deniability because of the timing of these things. I honestly have no idea if he's that cunning or if he is capable of that level of forethought, but that at least is a counter argument that could be worth something or I don't know, maybe nothing. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. But there is one point that BitBoy Crypto had in his statement that was very interesting coming from him in particular. Towards the end, he basically says that whatever threats plaintiff's counsel has received, they're nothing in comparison to what BitBoy Crypto has received in his own history. He talks about his family getting swatted and he talks about threats he receives on a regular basis. And then he says, quote, and that's every day for me and it's relentless. Frivolous lawsuits and false allegations have real consequences. They create echo chambers and attack vectors that only breed more hate. And this is absolutely true. But I wonder if he senses any irony in the fact that his harassment, even indirectly through his Twitter account, has the capability of doing exactly that. And this is one of the reasons why arguably it wouldn't even matter if he didn't actually call plaintiff's law firm and leave a bunch of harassing and threatening voicemails. He has around 1.5 million subscribers on YouTube and he has around 1 million followers on Twitter. Granted, some percentage may be bots, but even with that, there's a lot of people who for one reason or another have decided that whatever it is that he has to say is worth keeping track of. And he has used both of these platforms quite strongly in response to being named as a defendant in this lawsuit. And influencers really do need to be mindful of that when they tweet or post about other individuals, because they do have the ability to spur their followers to act on their words or to spur their haters who want to see the influencer to be held accountable for some bad consequences. In other words, there is a possibility that these voicemails could have been left by someone who was influenced by BitBoy Crypto to do so. And clearly, BitBoy Crypto is very aware of the impact of online hate, which means he arguably should be a little bit more considerate of the things that he himself is putting out there on the internet, which would mean that he's either very hypocritical or very not self-aware. But this leads me to my final point that BitBoy Crypto has been doing, which are not exactly the smartest thing in my personal opinion. And that is he is very fast and loose about information related to this lawsuit. Look, I understand wanting to win the court of public opinion. I also understand that when you've been accused of doing some heinous things, you also want to clear your name. But sometimes, especially when it comes to litigation, the best thing to do is to Shut up! Shut up. Sometimes as a client, you don't necessarily know what kind of information is going to be fine to share and what's not fine to share. As an example, here's BitBoy Crypto responding to one of my tweets about the hearing. Point five, my law team had repeatedly asked for the evidence so we can debunk it. My legal team says this doesn't make sense considering the entire point of a class action is provoking settlements. It's almost like the entire point of me getting included had been for a media circus. Regarding the point five, there was a whole thread of tweets. He seemed upset. But the main thing I want to point out here is he's talking talking about conversations he's had with his legal team and no less about settlements, which means he might be disclosing confidential communications between himself and his legal counsel, which further means he's disclosing communications that otherwise fall pretty squarely under the attorney-client privilege. And the thing about any kind of privilege is it can be waived in a number of ways. For example, tweeting about that conversation could destroy the privilege as to that communication. But even if it doesn't open the door for opposing counsel to poke around, it could also give opposing counsel breadcrumbs of information that your attorney might want to keep confidential just for strategic reasons. There is a lot of strategy in litigation. And look, if I'm representing someone, I do not want them talking about about settlements on social media because that can give opposing counsel ideas even as to how we're mentally approaching the litigation, our strategy regarding how to close it out, etc. And the client not being nearly as experienced in litigation just might not be aware of the pieces of information that they're leaving out there that can be pieced together by the opposing side. It's just 
not a good idea to do this. Okay, so tweets aside, what was the result of this whole dumpster fire? Well, according to the April 24th order, not much materially resulted, at least not immediately. The order to show cause was discharged and BitBoy Crypto was not sanctioned in any way. He was, however, quote, admonished to continue to comply with this court's April 20th, 2023 order, directing him to cease and refrain from posting or sending harassing and threatening communications, including paper and electronic communications and telephone calls directly or indirectly to plaintiff's counsel, Adam Moskowitz, his family, his partners and associates at the Moskowitz law firm, and any party or counsel in this case. Failure to comply with this court's order will result in the imposition of sanctions, including contempt proceedings. And see how it says in footnote one that the court said that, quote, the court's orders extend to conduct by Mr. Armstrong intended to cause others to engage in such conduct on his behalf or at his behest. So basically, this is a stern warning to BitBoy Crypto not to harass or threaten anyone on the opposing side and explicit instructions not to wield his massive social media following against them either. For many, this is kind of an unsatisfying ending, I'm not going to lie. For some, that feeling just comes from their general opinion of BitBoy Crypto as it has existed probably before this controversy. For others, it may come from the fact that there are many people in the judicial process that are in a lower social strata that often get punished more harshly and for much less. And honestly, what worries me in particular isn't so much that BitBoy Crypto himself is arguably getting a very soft treatment in all of this, but rather it's the fact that he has a very wide audience of people who are watching all of this unfold. And some of them might be thinking, huh, if he can get away with this, Maybe if I find myself in this position, so can I. That can lead to them getting a swift kick in the ass, or that can lead to more people disrespecting the judicial process. After all, we arguably are in a new age of litigation where trials and other court proceedings are broadcast all over the world through the internet. Overall, I'm a huge fan of this development because it means that more people can have access to our judicial system, if for nothing else, just to be able to understand it. But there is another side to that coin, which I think most judges, lawyers, and other people in the legal profession mostly haven't caught up to yet. And that's the fact that these higher profile cases are also to some degree training the public as to what to expect from our judicial system. And we certainly don't want people learning that they can essentially disrespect the entire judicial process and walk away completely unscathed. But those are my thoughts. What do you think about this whole thing? Do you think it's an outrage? Do you think it's a nothing burger? Do you think that the result is appropriate? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.